first and get ready for a very interesting you know rendition of news file this morning with journalists and joining us this morning Evans Mensa is head political desk Joy News and Joy FM Manasseh Azuri Awine the most decorated one of the most decorated journalists in our time editor-in-chief the fourth estates he's an investigative journalist Nana Ya Mensa he's she's supervising editor Asasi radio Ifia Pokua is broadcast journalist and programs director at the Despite Media Group. Sewa Amehir is broadcast journalist with GH1 Television. And Okatechi Efrifa Mensa is media practitioner and a chief. We will also be joined by Arthur Muni of the Ghana Journalist Association and Liz Hefron Asari journalists and media consultants let me welcome my guests who are already with us to the show this morning good morning ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us on news file thanks for having us great so first um let's start with you manasse the reactions have been quite uh, disturbing if you like the reactions appear to even worsen our image abroad. Um, if you read from the GJA, what the GJA had to say about how embarrassing and how they did not expect this kind of uh, rating, even though they knew that the country will drop, they didn't expect that this is how bad we will uh, get. And uh, many comments that have come. Uh, let's take a listen to just a few of the comments and then later I'll share with you the reaction of government. The beginning when Media Foundation for West Africa was calling on government to deal with certain issues with regards to journalists. I mean, nothing was done. Unfortunately, the Ghana Journalist Association was also very silent. And if you heard about any brutalities or any harassment of journalists, you didn't have the Ghana Journalist Association come out immediately either to condemn or to solidarize with its um, members. Mm. And so it's, it's not surprising that we are falling because. I think what is accounting for our significant drop is the political context. And that is what we really have to do a lot about. Mm. In terms of the other context, economic and so on, the impact is to a large extent on professionalism and sustainability. If you look at countries like Sierra Leone, that has become um, 41st from 75. And last year, we issued a report in which we were commending the government of Julius Mabatu for improving the first freedom environment significantly. And not surprisingly, they moved from 75th to 41st ahead of Ghana. Are we saying that the economic situation in Sierra Leone is better than it is in Ghana? My answer would be no. If you look at Burkina Faso, Burkina, um, uh, Burkina is now 41, Sierra Leone 46, I should say. Burkina is 41. The economic conditions in Burkina far better than it is in Ghana. I would say no. Niger is ahead of Ghana. Ivory Coast is ahead of Ghana. Quebec is ahead of Ghana. I don't think that these countries are ahead of us because their economic conditions are better than that of Ghana. Dialogue. The MPP tradition fought consistently for the recognition of the core democratic rights to governance in terms of association and movement and in addition to uh, speech with successive constitutions preceding the fourth republic accepting and implementing these rights we the mpp repealed the criminal libel law and rationalized the role of the nca as a regulator par excellence the real challenge now is balance recent reports both internal and external 
hyperbolically declaiming declaim, the supposed loss of media freedom in Ghana are painting and playing up a picture of systematic harassment against free speech. But is it truly the case? And does mainstream media and civil society experience that in their daily lives and activities? Moreover, is free speech limitless? And can it be mischievously used as an instrument to foster instability? These are key questions, objective answers to which can dampen the scurrilous damage to a hard-earned political stability and potential growth in the name of regime change. The MPP believes Ghana media is the freest ever and that its contributions to media growth are barreled in the Fourth Republic. In sum, MPP decriminalized speech, supported infrastructure and training of the International Press Center and support funds, and improved spectrum allocation and regulatory oversight. Free speech will continue its healthy climb under successive MPP administrations. Secondly, under the heading, a broken social contract, your mama woefully fails at painting an abysmal picture of democracy since 2017, insinuating a breach of MPP promises. So again, media and civil society should please let's fact check. The latest report speaks to, I mean, a reality for us as, as media practitioners. On the matter of safety, it's more lost on all of us. The issues to do with journalists who have been arrested in the last one year. And also, even as far back as one of our own who was uh, met in Cobra just in front of his house, Ahmed, Ahmed Hussein Tuali. I had, I had caused to write yesterday on Facebook very, very simply that the state of justice for Ahmed Hussein Tuali reflects press freedom in Ghana. What I meant by that is, if for many, many years since his passing, we have still not been able to get justice, not for him being a member of our media fraternity, but for his family, for, for the wife, for the for the child, for the entire uh, Suwali family, as an indicator that, look, when a journalist is touched, when somebody is killed in cold blood, and the state has a responsibility to get to the bottom of it and find the perpetrator and have the person dealt with, it gives a strong signal for us as practicing journalists that when any of us is touched tomorrow, justice will be said. Right. So, um, I'd like us first, if it is possible, because we have been discussing the issue all week, to go to some of the reactions, particularly from uh, state actors, including uh, Yabwa Benga Samoa, um, if we may also listen to Kojo Opon Kroma, um, what he has to say, the information, information minister. Um, okay, he issued a statement. We'll share portions of you for, for you, and some of you have already read uh, some of those statements already. Now, begin with you, uh, Manasseh. Um, if you could start by looking at what, for example, um, Yabwabi Asamoah suggests. You are the freest media in the world. You have nothing to worry about. The things you are talking about are not objectively analyze as far as he's concerned uh, this world freedom rankings i mean to be polite is bogus well samson if you had asked me this question six or seven years ago i would have agreed with him i attended conferences in the past and when i spoke about the media freedom in ghana journalists from other countries often came to me and told me how lucky i was unfortunately that is not the same and i have been doing this work for at least 10 years i started writing and critical pieces when president kufo was in power i did a bit under president mills but most of my journalism has been under President Mahama and then President Kufado. And the difference is clearer than day and night. I'm saying this because of two things. Not only have we seen increased attacks, 
but we are looking at the severity and also the actors involved. It was very common to threaten somebody and one would take it lightly. But if your colleague investigative journalist is put on television and threatened openly, and later that person is killed, you are going to treat threats seriously and differently. Also, we are beginning to see state actors that are getting involved, the national security. And we know the national security in Ghana is like uh, an extension of the government or the governing party. So we saw what the national security did to the modern Ghana journalist. Till date, we have not been told the offense this journalist committed, apart from we knowing that they had published something unpalatable about the national security minister at the time. We know what happened to Caleb Kuda. We also know what the police started doing with the law of publishing false news, which President Kufado in 2011 condemned the government when the police arrested somebody for publication of false news. The person accused Rawlings of burning his own house. The president now did not take it lightly. And what has happened in some of those instances are very close to the presidency. I mean, the uh, Mensah Thompson of his ASEPA accused or alleged that the president's family used the presidential jet to do shopping. The military denied he apologized and retracted, but he was still arrested. We also know that Kwabina Bubiyansa also accused the first lady of something and he was also arrested. So we are seeing something close to the presidency or the government. The third and final leg of it, which for me is very worrying, is the body language of the president. Last year, for instance, you read the, the, the information minister's press statement, they mentioned other countries that also did poorly when compared to their previous ranking. And they mentioned the Netherlands. A journalist, an investigative journalist covering drug issues was murdered in the Netherlands. The Prime Minister, the European Union, almost everybody who spoke said this was an attack, not only on press freedom, but it was an attack on the democracy of their country. Now we have Ahmed Swale who was murdered after he was openly, openly threatened by a politician, a top politician of the governing party. And we had the president of this country go to the bar conference in Takrade and said, in as much as the death was unfortunate, it was equally unfortunate for people to say that his killing was linked to press freedom. When that body language is... <sighs> okay, so uh, our line just got a bit uh, the step to Manasi Azure Awune. And uh, Manasseh, uh, thank you. He's actually uh, far away from town and uh, has agreed to do this uh, post wherever he is to do this uh, with us. Um, do we have Manasseh back? Uh, yes. Yes, Manasseh, continue. His followers, it doesn't pretend well for press freedom. We, one of the regions, and when he was speaking, Okay, so the, your line is being. Hello, can you hear me, Samson? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. So, what I'm saying is that when the president acts in this manner, the followers begin to think that it is okay for us to do what we have to do or we want to do to journalists. And I'm contrasting this, this body language with what I experienced under President Mahama. When I did the Ford expedition story, I have said how the government reached out to me to give me police protection, and I felt so safe at the time that I declined. But within that same period, I was about to launch a book, and someone told me, well, have you invited President Mahama? So I laughed and said, looking at these circumstances, why would I invite him? And the person said, John Mahama is tolerant to your fault. If you invite him, he would come. 
It couldn't come because that day I know there was, that was the day the Munche three were jailed and there was some crunch meeting at the presidency. But the president sent somebody to represent him at my book launch in that critical moment and was the one who even bought the highest when the auction was done. What this body language meant was that if there was someone out there who wanted to attack me, the person would think twice that the John Mahama I'm fighting for is the same John Mahama at Manassas book launch. So there's no need to what? Attack. And so when I talk about the body language, I do not think that the current president we have has treated these comments so seriously, these attacks. They always almost try to defend and try to justify and try to make it appear as though there was no problem and only some journalists and civil society groups were making noise. To the extent that people like Sam Jonah, Sir Sam Jonah, even joined. And I thought they would take it seriously, but each time they told us there was no cause for alarm. And so what we have seen in the ranking is just a confirmation of what we've been talking about all along. Mm. Um, but even before this was released, um, Elizabeth Ohine, a very well-known uh, veteran, you call journalist, uh, has been with the BBC, um, didn't take lightly to a BBC documentary that, you know, criticized this country for uh, cracking down, as it were, journalists or press freedom. And you took issue with her. Of course, now she's in government, but um, does that, should that deprive her of stating her reality just like you have the opportunity to do? Well, I think it would be unfortunate if I say Elizabeth Ohine should lose her voice because she's in government. She has her voice and she's free to discuss whatever she wants to discuss. I am also free to point out to her the loopholes in her discussion or her argument. When she pointed out to the BBC that the Media Foundation for West Africa is no longer uh, in a position to present unbiased opinion on this government, she did not back it with any fact. But we know that if you go to ministerial vetting, every data that is quoted on press freedom is researched by the Media Foundation for West Africa. On the, uh, in the sub-region, West Africa, there is no more noticeable voice, credible voice than the Media Foundation for West Africa. For years now that we have had issues with the uh, Ghana Journalists Association, but for the Media Foundation for West Africa, journalists wouldn't have had any voice to speak for them. So if you go to attack institutions without providing basis, then some of us are also willing to point the facts to you. Instead, the BBC should have spoken to entities like the National Media Commission. And what he failed to provide, she failed to provide by way of context is that the National Media Commission is now headed by an appointee of the president, which a number of people have issues with. He also tried to make it look as if there are no issues and that the BBC shouldn't have spoken to people like will be answered because the kind of journalism will be answered is doing should have been taken into account. I have stated publicly that I have issues with some of the utterances of Bobi Ansa, but the context here is that what he did was not criminal. The first lady could have, could have sued him for defamation. And something I take this so seriously because I have been sued six times for stories I have published. In each of the seals, those who sued me said... Um, what I published was false. All the six of them ran away from their cases. If the current uh, style is to be applied, then it means that on six of the case, uh, occasions, I would have been arrested. I would have been put in cells. I would have been charged. And if there was no case against me eventually, I would have still suffered some punishment. And at least on six occasions, 
and could have been arrested and put behind bars. And that alone is enough to humiliate a journalist. Mm. So what I am pointing out to Elizabeth Ohine is that it is true this journalist may have said something that is wrong, but is the, is the, the, the right thing, in my view, was that whoever felt defamed could have sued. Mm. If you begin to use the police, then it is going to be harassment. All right. Um, so in, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, from the BBC's report on press freedom in Ghana, very dim, uh, you know, outlook for Ghana, uh, quite country image tarnishing uh, for Ghana. We also had the uh, U.S. State Department report on human rights also refer to issues and uh, treatment of journalists or media. And uh, that was also equally uh, embarrassing. And then now we have the World Press Freedom uh, Rankings. In all these situations, uh, speakers of government, appointees of the government and the party have, if you like, played what people say, the ostrich, as if, you know, the things that are being spoken about are not real issues. What do you say to the response of the information ministry in the statement issued by Kojo Opon Kroma? Something it is ironic that uh, all of these are happening when we have a journalist as the information minister. Uh, some of us have worked with him and we believe that some of the things we are talking about were also of concern to him when he was with us. When I read the statement, I saw that they largely want to blame it on the methodology. But if you look at the countries that did well last year, the first country is still the uh, first country this year, that's Norway, with the same methodology. And they try as much as possible to push much of the blame to one of the matters. That is the economy. And if you look at what the Reporters Without Borders have been written under that in terms of Ghana, they also make mention of the fact that government does not distribute advertising revenue transparently if they want to advertise. And this is common knowledge that if NDC is in government, you find a number of state entities and state-owned institutions advertising in NDC tabloids. And if MPP is in government, you see that a lot. All of these account for even that economy or the economic aspect of it that they are blaming on and trying to make it appear as though the government has no hand in it. Again, if you look at some of the policies that the government through the NCA wants to implement, I know that Joy FM, Asempai FM, and a number of radio stations may have their frequencies cut by more than half from 100 kilometer radius to about 45 kilometer radius. What this means is that if somebody was advertising on Joy and now knows that, well, Joy is not able to go as far as it should have gone, it is likely to affect the uh, advertising revenue of Joy City and a few of the media houses that are doing critical journalism. When you do this, you are indirectly crippling the financial status of the media houses. And so the government cannot even be completely absolved of wrongdoing if we want to critically look at the economic aspect of the ranking. Okay. Uh, Having said... Mm. I wanted to ask you this uh, last one so that I move on to Evans Mensah. Um, you spoke about the question of safety of journalists and the fact that you did the most daring you know, stories, exposés during Mohammed's era, and yet you felt secured, but this time you feel insecure. Um, without revealing much, what is the, what is the cause of that? Uh, many will say that even in this regime, you have done some of the, uh, if you like, very dangerous uh, investigative pieces. Uh, people have lost their jobs. People are having to hide because they can't come into the public anymore uh, because you have exposed their corrupt, you know, uh, conduct. Um, so what is the basis of 
you feeling secured when you did that during Mohammed's era and don't feel secured now? Samson, it is unfortunate I'll not be able to reveal everything, but I can say that the very first time I took a death threat to the police was in 2017. And the CID board at the time, Mame Yadodankwa would attest to this, and also the head of cybercrime units. The other time I took another serious death threat to the police, was in 2020 and reported at the police CID headquarters. The very first time I had to leave this country out of serious security implications was in 2019. And the second time I had to leave was in 2020. Unfortunately, sometimes you are not able to come public with all the details, but I remember in 2020, the DW, that's Deutsche Vella, was having a debate with Otokono and then I think Richard Ahiago of the MPP. And when it came to press freedom, the MPP rep on that debate said, well, the Manasi you are mentioning is so safe, he's doing his work. I can tell you this afternoon there was a press conference in Accra, Manasi came and covered, he's safe. When the interview ended, the woman doing that interview on the Facebook channel of DW called me and said, did you hear that? And I said, I did. And why did she ask? At the time they were saying I was safe, I was actually in Germany, in the same town the interviewer was. <laughs> so these are some of the realities that some of us face. And I cannot say everything, but I've given context as to how the government at the time approached issues. Okay. They would deal with your issues and try to leave your personality. And I will say that some of the most difficult years for me as a journalist have been the last five years. And okay. I don't think that mm. Uh, what I have said and what has happened to others, if I see that a colleague journalist has been threatened, mm. the next moment that journalist is killed, I'm not going to take press as I used to have them. Okay. Um, I, I, I said that would be my last one, but in a minute, um, you know, it's a difficult interview to have with you uh, on the subject because uh, I'm your lawyer. <laughs> So it's difficult to actually uh, also ask questions that may reveal certain things. Um, but you mentioned, for example, the Mahama Ford Gate, which the NDC believes contributed greatly to favor the NPP. The NPP used that weapon massively to favor them in their election victory and causing the NDC also to lose. Um, you speak about the fact that when you did that particular story, right after the broadcast that you know, day, you got a call from the communications minister then, um, Omane Buama, asking assurance if you were safe and if you were not to ensure that there was security deployment to protect you and you declined because you felt safe. But before you made the publication, you were put in a most uncomfortable situation, including comments that came from the same place that you said, you know, are tolerant and you feel safe even after the publication. Is that not so? Yes, something. And those comments are very normal uh, with the kind of work I do. I don't expect the NDC. Manasi, I'm not time. talking. I'm not talking. I, I started with a caveat because we can't say things in public. I'm not talking about public comments, comments that were not public but known to you, made to you, yes. either directly or on phone. Yes, those comments were not threatening comments. So, for instance, I have written about part of it in the, my book, The Fourth John, so I can speak about it. Uh, the president's friend who happens to be a mutual friend met me 
and said he had not been directed by the president to tell me this, but they know that I was coming out with an investigation and that if that story broke at that time, they had no chance in the uh, election. And their worry was that I was the one on the beat. If it were any other journalist, how much would they demand that they couldn't pay? But for me, they knew no amount of money would make me drop it. So if possible, I should hold on till after the election. When that failed, there was this suggestion that they could give me some information about a Kufuadu who was also going somewhere to take money for his campaign. So that if I published those two together, they would also have something to say about the NPP. And I said, no, that wasn't going to work. A tribal card was tossed, it didn't work. And I eventually went ahead and did a story. All right. These sources were not antagonistic. And I can tell you that even under this uh, 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 government, there have been times very high ranking people talk to me to see if I could uh, uh, do something about a story when the promo started. And so this is very neat. Uh, this, sorry, this is very normal okay. for somebody like me. But the difference is the kind of commentary, the mm. kind of message, the kind of threats All right. you receive. Mm. Manasse, Manasse, thank you very much. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please um, uh, pardon me because he's actually in transit. He's traveling and needed to stop and be able to uh, speak to us. And then perhaps in the course we if he gets to a stable area, we can reconnect with him when you are all having the conversation. Um, let me come to you, Evans. Now, um, what's your reality when you read um, this uh, report and you have engaged many people in the course of the week on this very, very, you know, battering, niching, image battering uh, report for us? I want your reality. So the report, for me, I, I took it um, in, in, in two different dimensions. So there's a third dimension, which is the, the broader view, and then there's a more specific view to it, where, where you look at the specific indicators that were measured, and then there's a broader view. Now, to the question, if you look at the broader view, where you look purely at the rankings, where we are, we're at 60, that definitely doesn't tell a good story. If you drill down to some of the specifics that the um, World Press Freedom Index has touched on, one of the things that speaks to my reality is the political context. And this is something that the Reporters Without Borders themselves had articulated in explaining uh, some of the reasons why they ranked us at 60 in the world. They talk about the fact that to, to, to protect their jobs, and they're talking about journalists, their security, the journalist security in Ghana, they increasingly resort to self-censorship. And it is to that, that phrase, that, that self-censorship issue, that for me speaks to a current reality. Now, many people won't know, but in many newsrooms, including our own, Colleagues do stories that are very critical, and, and, and people say I'm, I'm diabolical. I am, you know, something you've been, you, you've produced me a top story. We, you know, for, for us, it's a, if it has to be controversial, that's the thing that you do. You don't care whose ox is gone. You, you go out there on top story every day, and, and you do your stuff. If it's the president, you say it as it is. You want to be as, as controversial and tell the story in a way that people pay attention to. But that's journalism for you. So far as you're factual, you, you are okay to do the story. But in newsrooms now, you, you're doing a story, a story come and you're simply passionate about you're going to do a story. The comments that you hear colleagues pass, and some of, sometimes it's done in jest, but if you drill down, it's actually coming from a place. They tell you, Charlie, they'll come for you, right? And, and in many newsrooms now, you see people say this on a daily basis, on a regular basis to you. We are self-censoring. And, and I've done this job for 18 years, so I know what I'm saying. You are, we are self-censoring more now than we used to be. You, you are thinking a bit more. You, you write the headline, you are thinking a bit more about the implication of this headline um, than you would, you would do before. And for me, that is one of those silent areas we haven't talked about enough. I know Malazi has talked a lot about the physical attributes of the, of the fear of harm. And so I will not belabor that point. But for me, that 
point that the reporters without borders touched on it is so critical to the reality today there must be a reason for this and one of the reasons for this is and i have disagreed with the president quite forcefully when his public utterances unfortunately reinforces this view and leads journalists like myself and others to sell sunset bay more look you might be you, you might eventually overcome the self-censorship after you've looked at the headline in, in a thousand ways, which you shouldn't really, because it's factual. That's for me, that, that fundamentally is all you should look at. Is this factual? If it's factual, write it. But when you pause for a longer time, you, call, you consult colleagues, sometimes it has to go all the way up just to check whether what you're writing, you know, your, the, the implications of it, there might be something wrong there. But back to the point. Sometimes the president's own utterances publicly lead to this, um, you know, extreme self censorship that we do. And I'll, I'll give an example. Very recently last year, John News decided to do a series of conversations, have a series of conversations about the, uh, about the uh, free senior high school policy. And that's what journalists do. What we do is after every, we need to hold government's feet to the fire. We need to hold government accountable to the people in fact. It is a constitutional injunction in Article mm. in Chapter 12 of the Constitution. Yeah. That we, we, that. We, we, should right. be, we should be playing you that sound clip from the president, but make the point uh, where he speaks about the free SHS and what he thinks it is the thing that you are doing at multimedia. Absolutely. And, and then the president gets an opportunity. And then this, this is the president is a well, well known, renowned lawyer. He knows that we have a legal constitutional injunction to hold him, his government, accountable to the people, right? If you've implemented a, a very um, fantastic policy, as in the free SHS, you're spending possibly, well, not even possibly, the, the facts from the budget shows it. One of the biggest line items in the budget in terms of government intervention policy is the free SHS. If you do that, you spend the taxpayers' resources to implement such a, 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 a fantastic, uh, wide-ranging, very important, and, and my, and, and my uh, brother benefits from this, and we applaud the government for this. If you do that, though, you will need the, the citizens to sort of evaluate what you're doing. Um, and the journalists must do that, because every Ghanaian can do that, right? And so we must do that. We must give you the feedback. And we give microphones to people to do just that, a constitutional injunction. And then the president gets an opportunity to speak about this work that a journalist was doing. And this is what he says, quote, a radio station is currently running a campaign. Mm. Hold, it. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, Evans, let's play, let's hear the president's own voice on this subject. The Ghanaian media has in fact enriched the nation's governance by its curiosity, investigative skills, and persistence. Today, the Ghanaian citizen is able to give boldly and freely his or her feedback on policies and programs of government. Society groups are able to interrogate fearlessly government actions and positions, compare them to global best practices, and offer views and critiques aimed at complementing the efforts of government. And the political opposition is able to raise dissent openly, canvas for alternative viewpoints, and by so doing, offer our citizens alternatives to consider on all key issues of our national discourse. No wonder Ghana is, according to Reporters Without Borders, the number one country in Africa in the Global Press Freedom Index. So what do I make of the current accusations that are being made the freedoms are under attack under the Kufuado government. I do not claim to have been a lone knight in shining armor, but it is fair to say we went through many battles together to get where we are today in the media sphere in our country. We did not wake up suddenly one morning to find ourselves with over 400 different radio stations and dozens of television channels instead of one radio station and one television station, both owned by the state and under the firm and unrelenting control of government. 
Evan, sir, my sincere apologies. Sir, having a little difficulty with my production. We'll bring you that voice, but go ahead with your quotation. The president says a radio station is currently running a campaign against free SHS. During the last election, I got the clear impression free SHS had been endorsed by all political parties. And all we need to do was to keep improving it. Would a spirited defense of the free SHS policy constitute an attack on press freedom? I wonder. Now, it is the first line for me that is the, that is a problem. Where, he, where the president characterizes a, a piece of journalistic work that in, in essence only gives the microphone to the people to give the government feedback on a very important national policy like the free SHS, to characterize that as running a campaign against a policy, it is unfortunate to say the least, but what it, what it does to the journalist who's doing this work comes back to the self-censorship issue that the, the Reporters Without Borders highlights as part of the reason why we are scoring this low. A journalist hears that from the president. So that is how your president characterizes your work when you're being, when you're not, if you're not even being critical. You're simply opening the phone lines and asking people experiencing the free SHS in real time to give feedback to him and his policy implementers. And he says that is a campaign against it. That is unfortunate. And that feeds into the self-censorship issue. And for me, that has been one of the key things that we are experiencing in newsrooms now in terms of reality. There's a fear there that somebody, the president may mischaracterize what you're doing as one, a campaign, as two, a politically motivated agenda against this government. And that often influences, no one necessarily he does, but what others, as Kukubaku will always call them, the, 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 the fringe elements, right, around his government and people who think they hold allegiance to him and, and are loyal to him, they then begin to take a cue from what the president had said, mm. and then they then begin to do the attacks. And so you hear people like in the Japan go on the radio and attack journalists because the signal from, from, from above is what they are doing could possibly be a campaign against us. Right. That, for me is that for me is unfortunate. Mm. But having said that, that's a broader view. Right. And then if you drill down to the specifics, though, you, we, you, you begin to look at the key things that emerge. And just a minute on that. We did not do poorly in the, all the aspects of the things that they measured. That's and right. it, has to be, it has to be emphasized. That's right. We did very well in areas such as legislative indicator, 81%. We That's did right. very well in social indicator. In fact, we didn't even do as poorly as the specifics suggest in the examples Manasseh and I had given mm -hmm. when it comes to the political indicator, because the 66% there, the poorest performance, and it's true. I mean, you can look at Kujo Pankrumah's statement and say, Manasseh will say, well, you know, we want to draw attention to the economic indicator. But the fact is, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the reporters without borders indicators and the expert panel measures this and say, that is the poorest in 47%. So it is important that we look at that specific. And they give a caution. And when I was doing PMS, at that very point, doing PMS was this week, and I asked the reset decks to help me drill this down. They came back to me with a caution, because we had done a, a, um, a trail analysis of, the, of the, um, right, the, the, the index. And I was going on there to make the point that this is the index, this is the trend. And it came back to me and alerted me that we should look at some, a, a document that had been published as part of this. And I see later that it was reflected in the Kujo Konskuma's statement. But it is important nonetheless, if you do research and put it in context, they say that in light of this new methodology, care should be taken when comparing the 2022 rankings and scores with those of 2021. That's and right. for me, that is important to observe. But if, if you drill down, we'll come back to that later some of the specific um, things that it measures, then we can begin to address which particular areas 
should we be addressing in terms of the interventions going forward right. to improve this the next round? So we'll deal with the solutions. We are talking your reality and solutions. And uh, thank you very much. I know that you are also hard pressed for time, but uh, stay with us a little while longer. Um, let me go to um, Sewa. Sewa, I'm here. Sewa, are you with us? Hello, Sewa. Um, hello, Sewa, please unmute. Um, okay. Yes. Um Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you yes, very. I'm thank here. you very much. Right. Um, so you have been in the mainline broadcast business for how long now? So I have been doing this uh, a little over four years. I am not as. Uh, I haven't been in it as long as Evans and Manasse, mm. but it's just a little over four years. So using your experience, gauging your experience against the reports. What do you say? Well, so um, I, I would just say that, you know, this report is just a reflection of the reality in the media practice. I haven't been around for long. Uh, I haven't experienced, I wasn't in active journalism when uh, other governments were in power, but the um the figures are there for all of us to see right and um, even in the in the four or five years that i have been around i have seen i have experienced uh, quite a number of things there is nothing in that report that was not known to all of us since we all live here we have heard and we have seen several instances of abuse against journalists there have been many reports by journalists who say for the fear of their well-being, you know, they don't do A, B, C when they criticize this government. I have had colleagues who have suffered one form of abuse or the other or threats. So I had a colleague uh, in the Upper West region, Edward Adetsi, who had to leave the region twice because he had done... Uh, a story which got a, a minister of state to resign in 2019. His house was attacked. It was ransacked. Every, you know, he was literally um, abused, and he had to come to Accra for almost two months. When when that happened, I recall that the Ghana Journalist Association um, issued a statement, as they always do, condemned the attack, and said that they were going to ensure that Edward was safe, and that was it. My colleague, Redwan Karimdini Osman, was also abused, not by um, a politician or a state actor. And I recall very well, so Afel Moni went to visit Redwan at the hospital, took a picture with him and posted it, issued a statement, condemned the attack, and that was it. Till date, I mean, no one followed to ensure that, you know, these journalists got some justice. Nothing was, was done. It, it was, it just stops, the bus just stops uh, for the GJA with, with, with issuing statements and that's it. And I have a problem with, with that, you know, if, if the institution or the association that is supposed to look out for the safety of journalists are always seen to be just issuing statements and then it ends there. I mean, who then is going to stand up for us? Mm. You know, I don't know. I, I mean, it's good that Afel is here to tell us what the GJA has done, for instance, in, 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 in pushing to know what happened with Ahmed Swale's killing. Because as we sit here, we know that no one has been punished for that. We heard Manasseh speak. We know that Manasseh had to flee the country you know, on that documentary that he did. I have had instances where Manasseh, for instance, will call me. I haven't been threatened, but I have been abused severally on social media for questioning certain government policies, for st saying one thing or the other about the government. And I have, I have spoken with people who, who are in government and they say that, look, when you people tweet or write certain things on social media, 
we send our arsenals after you. So we said that, look, Sewa just tweeted something. Go and attack it. Go and read it and do whatever you want to do to her. I have been a victim of that several times on several locations. And there are people on this platform. There's um, Efia Pokia, there's Evans Mensa, there's Manasseh who have called to find out if I'm okay. And there are people, you know, there are journalists who say that I won't tweet. I won't do this because I cannot stand the criticism and the insults that comes with some of these posts. So I have suffered that. Now, I mean, while I appreciate, you know, Samson, the right of governments to rebuttal, I, I believe that setting up social media trolls to personally attack journalists for being critical is not the way to go. So there was a time where the, the, there was a member of parliament who on the social media page was making a lot of noise um, about a bridge that he had he had constructed for his constituency. I saw it and, uh, you know, I said, I mean, this is, this is something that these people deserve. It's not something that you need to rub it in our face like you've done something that hasn't been done before. That member of parliament's social media account personally attacked me, insulted me, you know, and you, like I said, I appreciate the right of governments to rebuttal. Mm. You, if it, we've so, so what, what, what we've has been said? Ha, what has been said over time is that you journalists um, have opinions on almost everything, and you criticize as harshly as and violently as you can. But you cannot stand the same measure of criticism, and that should not be said to be stifling uh, press freedom what do you say to that well something I, I i don't believe that anyone on this platform right now um evans a pia pokia and anaya mensa and all that will will have a problem if we say something and you believe that what we have said is untrue only come back with facts to rebut what we said for instance, I mean, I listen to Evans every time. I listen to Kiapokia. When they are making statements, they don't, they, don't, they don't just come and sit on radio and just speak. speak. They come with facts. So government says that it has constructed uh, so so and so kilometer of roads. And then they come with facts and say that is not the case. From the research that we have done, this is what we know. So it is only fair that when you want to make a rebuttal, you come with facts to rebut what we have said not with insults, not by sending your arsenals to insult us on things that have got nothing to what is being discussed. Mm. And that is where we have a problem with. When you come with facts, what can we do? I mean, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's for the, it's, it's for the country, right? So I don't have a problem if, you know, state actors or politicians or even their followers who they send to attack us come with facts and say, this is what we know and what you're saying is a lie. Uh, we, know, we know, we know, we know that happened. we know that government has been accused of um, recruiting an army uh, of people to do social media sort of, if you like, attack or uh, PR for it. But um, this claim has not been, as it were, uh, confirmed by government that in fact it has recruited such, you know, uh, people in their hundreds. Uh, we're told that the NDC had done a bit of that earlier, but the NPP appears to have um, uh, superseded and done quite a better job at employing in 400 and something of them or so who do this job. Um, so could it not be the case that the people you say attack you are not actually government people? You know, um, something I was saying earlier that I, I, I spoke with uh, someone who works at the presidency and he told me, you know, and some other colleague of mine in confidence that we have people and obviously we don't expect them to come out and say that, yes, we have put together these people. We don't expect them to, but they have told us that they have people and we know some of the people. And they also tell us that they have been recruited by some members in government to do some of these things for them. So they do it. I don't expect anyone to come out and accept or say that, yes, uh, we send these people or we know them. But they do have people. They have them. And they send them after us. We know them. 
We know some of them. We have seen some of them and their tweets and the kind of positions that they hold in governments. So yes, we know them. We, do, we don't even need them to admit to us that they send them, but we know them. So this, in fact, is your reality when you gauge the report. Have you been to the place where you personally have to also self-censor because you are scared, you are uncertain of the, of the reaction of your publication, however factual it is? Oh, yes, I, 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 I've, I've had um, a couple of those instances, uh, quite many of them, actually. Um, you have to be careful. You don't want certain attacks. And at some point, you just say that, you know, let me just slow down a bit or tone down a bit. Because you ask yourself, you know, all these attacks that come, are they really, are, are, are they really worth it? Are they really worth it? So I've had several instances where I've had to, I've said to myself that, Stella, look, you need to slow down. Just, just calm down. And I, I'm sure that every, every single member, of, you know, uh, every other person I know, journalists, especially my, in my organization, uh, is doing the same thing. Because as for self-censorship, we are all doing it. You know, and there's also another part of the reports that I want to look at, which is the mm. economic aspect. And Manasseh was saying earlier that you, as there are certain media houses that don't get certain jobs because we all know why. You know, and in in in, in the run up to when the twenty twenty, like, when you say jobs, you mean you mean well, adverts. advertisements, okay. advertisements. You know, in the run up to the 2020 elections, for instance, my media house, uh, GH1 TV, didn't get certain advertisements from the government because um, a member of the party told me, a leading member of the NPP told me that when we come and play our documentaries on GH1 TV, right after you people air stories. Um, on your news about how bad some situation somewhere is and you know cancelling every good thing that we have said in that documentary which we have paid money for so what's the point so they won't they won't bring the documentary to the station and we have suffered it quite a number of times they 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 hold certain programs and you don't see us on there and obviously and they have told me i mean like i said leading members of the party have said it to me that these are the reasons why we don't bring some of the the documentaries to your station because right after yes you take it and air it but right after you do something to counter what we played mm. and it's it's as though we are not supposed to be doing our jobs and we are supposed to be doing the bidding of one party or the other and mm. it's just let me just say that it is not for, I'm not saying this just for the NPP. I mean, I get members of the NBC equally attack me in the same measure, you know? So it, it doesn't, it's not, I'm not saying that I get attacks just from the ruling government, but it's both ways. Mm. Just say something that doesn't sit well with them and that's mm. all. All right. That's um, the only thing you to trigger. Okay, so I will take a quick break. When we return, we'll get to Fia Pokwa and also um, Nanaya, and seek to establish if this in fact is their reality and the question when Evan speaks about people are free afraid of attacks and the word is used they will come after you they will come for you who do you mean when you say they will come for you or come after you beyond social media bullying is there anything beyond that